Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Rusty Beauties. And I bet you anything that you haven't seen this car for a long time on the channel. Like, you probably saw her on the background here and there, but she hasn't been featured on the channel for a long time. And she's actually the initial car that started the Rusty Beauties channel. We picked her up in 2015 and she looked like this. Then a year later she looked like this. And it's 2023 now, and now she looks like that. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong with her. I mean, she's been serving me well for the last seven years, I think. She was on the road, and for most of these summers, except the summer when I had a broken leg, but the rest of the summers, she's been my daily driver. So she has marks of wear and tear here and there. Um, I'm not really proud of what's happening under the bonnet, I'll show you. I mean, she runs great and everything is perfect, but the condition of the engine bay is disgusting because I'll show you later, we're gonna get there. But I mean, marks, there's all over the place, like if you see here, there's a chip, there's a chip here from when I'm putting on and off my uh, soft top here as well, there's a big chip. There's something here even, I don't even know, I don't count them anymore, here, look, the door was initially touching here, the bonnet, and it scratched itself, so there are lots and lots of these marks all over the place. There's one big one in one place that I'm not going to show you, because I'm really ashamed of that, it is partially my fault from day one of the restoration. It's kind of hidden, so I'm trying not to show it to people <laughs> so if they find it out they find it out if they don't i'm happy anyways so the reason she is in the garage today is not because she has an issue she's like we took her for a drive the other day with my son nicola and she drove really well but the reason she is here is because i want to hook her up to the snap-on counselor 2 scope and I want to see what it's gonna say because like I said she doesn't have an issue she's been running well but I just want to see what the scope is gonna say the primary and the secondary ignition forms and all that you know because she has points she doesn't have electronic ignition and to be honest since day one when I restored the engine I believe I installed this engine in it in 2016 so since this engine has been rebuilt and installed in the car i never ever touched anything i mean the alternator bracket broke once and i changed the radiator and stuff like that but the engine itself i haven't touched and why would i touch it if she runs okay but again i want to see if the scope thinks just like i think or it's going to show that there's an issue here and there so anyways, without further ado, let me pop up the bonnet. And like I said, I'm not proud with what's underneath, but maybe this summer I'm gonna find time to take care of it. Let me show you. All right, here goes nothing. Ta-da! <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, guys. You see? There's rust all over the place. The linkage on the carbs. Let me bring you closer. All the hardware. All the linkage on the carbs. Everywhere where there's bare metal, everything is rusted. Even the cup here. Like, you know what I'm talking about? The cover used to be nice and shiny. But unfortunately, she was sitting in a very humid underground garage for the first, I don't know, three, four, five winters. Then it sat for two winters inside my garage, but the last winter, again, she sat outside in a tent. Hopefully this summer I'm gonna find time. I doubt it, but I wish I could. I could find time to take everything apart, clean it, and maybe, maybe I could replace the hardware with new one, and the linkage I could, uh, zinc plate or something i don't know but again she, she's running great so that's why i don't worry too much about her because she's a driver so that's what happens with time anyways enough of me talking let me start her so you can see what i'm talking about she runs great she runs great 
There you go. She has a little bit of a loose chain, that's what I think. Because when she's cold and I start her initially, there's a lot of rattling coming from under the timing cover. But once the oil builds up, the rattling disappears. But she's shaking, you see? She's shaking a little bit, so... Um, look how the how everything vibrates the bumper vibrates the exhaust vibrates and it squeaks so anyways let me hook it up to the scope and see what it's gonna what it's gonna show okay so she's all set Let's start her and start the scope. Okay, so let's modify the engine data. So we have four cylinders, four stroke, and the firing order is one, three, four, two, right? I'm sitting on the tire, so my voice is going a little bit like a robot. <laughs> one, three, four, two. Okay, and let's start with the primary menu. So in the primary menu, we can see the form, the waveform first. So the waveform shows us what's happening in the primary circuit of the ignition system, which is the low voltage, the 12 volt. Ah, and I need to sit somewhere else because that's gonna make my voice weird. Okay, that's better. So, I'm not going to talk too much about how the ignition system works and the uh, waveform. At this point, I will assume that you know what we're talking about here. If you don't, maybe you should go and watch this video in which I explain exactly how the ignition system works and what the secondary waveform looks like and what the primary waveform looks like and all that. Here, I'm going to assume that you know. Very quickly, though, I'm going to say what a dwell is. Dwell is the time in which the points remain closed from the time they close to the time they open this period of time is called the dwell and that's when the current is flowing through the primary winding of the ignition coil so that's why after the points close we have a load and the voltage drops but then it continues as a straight line all the way until the points open so as soon as the points open we induce high voltage in the primary so for cylinder number one, this dwell, dwell period looks pretty good. Sometimes you have fluctuations here, which means that your points are bad or they bounce if we have a fluctuation, fluctuation right here after the voltage drop, but this looks pretty much okay. So in the primary waveform, the dwell is what we are interested in from here to here. We can diagnose a lot from this part of the waveform. It doesn't show us much in the primary. In the secondary circuit, it's more interesting for us. So one looks okay. Let's see number two. Number two looks, okay, looks the same. Three and four. That's actually pretty good. So let's parade them. Parade, now it shows us all the cylinders. That's one, three, four, and two in the same order, in the firing order. And it looks pretty good. This, by the way, shows us the RPM in the moment. And this shows us the degrees of camshaft rotation during which the points are closed. So the dwell continues for 45 to 46 degrees for cylinder 4. But we can look at that in a separate screen here, which is the dwell bar graph. So now here it tells us how many degrees is our dwell for each cylinder. And it looks like number 3 is a little bit shorter than the others, which means only one thing that the cam in the distributor is a little bit worn for cylinder three because it's different than the other three cylinders you see so it keeps the points closed for shorter period of time it's the same here in percentage it shows you that cylinder three is worn a little bit not cylinder the the, the shaft is worn the cam on the shaft 
I was debating whether I need to install electronic ignition in this car, but maybe I'm going to do that because that's going to solve this problem. Otherwise, I have to change the distributor. Okay, so already learned something about the ignition. So that's about the primary circuit. We could see the primary waveform and we can see the well bar graph. So the next thing is let's see the secondary waveform. So let's start again with the waveform and see it for cylinder number one. So it shows what's happening in the secondary circuit, which is the high voltage one. This involves the secondary winding and the ignition coil. The high voltage leads to the spark plugs, uh, the spark plugs themselves, etc. So like I said, the part of this waveform that we're interested in is from when the voltage goes up until the spark extinguishes. So let me change the size. So this is the period of time in which we have spark. So what happens here, again very quickly, remember in the primary ignition circuit we had the same peak of voltage due to a process called self-induction. The primary ignition winding induces high voltage, which immediately by a process called mutual induction, so we induce a way higher voltage in the secondary winding because the secondary winding has a ratio of 1 to 100. So for every turn inside the primary winding, we have 100 turns inside the secondary winding. So that's why we have 100 times higher voltage in the secondary winding than the primary. So this voltage here goes to 6, 14, 16, 18 kilovolts. It can go even higher than that, but as it builds up, at some point it becomes so high that it overcomes the resistance of the gap between the rotor in the distributor and the cup, and also the gap in the spark plug. So as soon as it builds enough to overcome that resistance, it creates a spark. And as soon as we create a spark, the voltage stops rising, and instead it drops to a certain level, and this is when a spark starts burning inside the combustion chamber. And, it, and here at the end, when we burn all the compressed gases and fumes, then the spark plug extinguishes, and then we have these oscillations here that go back to zero, and then we have the new dwell period, etc., etc. So what we're interested here in is the spark, how long our spark is and how consistent it is. You see how it changes every, every once in a while. I think it misses. I don't know. So that's cylinder number one. Number two is a little bit longer. Look, that's one. Number two is longer. Number three, just like number one. It has all these oscillations here in the beginning, though. We have to see what they mean. And number four, same thing. Let's parade them. We can't see much on the parade form because the burn time here, the spark line is so short. Here you can see clearly the spark line. That's called the spark line or burn time. So if we want to know more about this spark line, we can go and check the other screens, the burn time bar graph. This, this screen tells us exactly how many milliseconds we sustain a spark and you can see here that it is between 1.4 and 1.8 it's the longest for cylinder number two for whatever reason let me just check the temperature just in case you know it's perfect not overheating anyway so here we can see that cylinder number two has the longest spark but any, anywhere between 1 and 2, we are good. And this here, you remember in the waveform how we have this uh, high voltage here? That goes to 16, 17. So we can see at the same time all of the cylinders, how much KV they build. So we can go and do that in KV bar graph. So right here it shows you, we can change the size here, the range, so we can see. It shows you the minimum 
per cylinder is from 11 to 16 and the maximum is that so again they're pretty consistent and we can also see a histograph of all the cylinders so so here it shows you 256 firings consecutive firings and it shows you for each firing how high the kv was one cylinder one two three and four so the straighter this line the better this tells you that the kv is consistent for each firing but it goes up and down which is normal let's go to cylinder this is what i'm interested in um, vacuum waveform we don't have a vacuum port i'm gonna see i need to figure out a way to to check the vacuum as well because i'm really interested to see what's going on uh, cylinder shorting bar graph i want to check that so in this screen the scope kills one cylinder at a time for five seconds and shows you what the, the rpm drop is for the engine without this cylinder you can do it manually but i prefer to do it automatically so let's do it so that's it without cylinder number one we're losing 200 rpm now all cylinders work for five seconds and now cylinder number three is killed for five seconds and cylinder number three doesn't produce so much eh? okay so it looks like cylinder number one and two contribute a little bit more than cylinder three and four so that can only be carburetor issue right or compression so let's do the final test which is the cranking amps bar graph for this test the scope kills all four cylinders at a time it allows the engine almost to start initially but then it kills them all and then you keep cranking and cranking and it measures for each cylinder how many amps that the starter require in order to overcome this compression so it compares the compression between all four cylinders so i'm gonna kill the engine now then we have to zero the probe where is it range select start amp probe zero so we zeroed the probe here and now let's start the test and then start cranking it mm. except my starter doesn't work very well so <laughs> i can't do that here as soon as the engine almost starts my starter starts spinning in the air and then when all the in, when all the cylinders are cute then my starter just spins without spinning the flywheel so can't do that all right so we went through all the tests and we collected some information and now let's analyze it a little bit so let's go back to the secondary waveform and see what this spark line means with all these fluctuations and the rise at the end so normally it should be a straight line with a little nose at the end like i don't know how well you see but it goes pretty much straight and then it has a little nose at the end here though we have something like this upward sloping spark line indicates spark plug internal resistance so these spark plugs are six years old so you know what let's change them and see if that line is gonna change I don't even remember what kind of spark plug I have here <clears throat> oh wow look at that <laughs> pretty sharp electrode huge gap wow i'm surprised this car was even running so they are ngk bpr5 egp where did i get this oh my god i'm surprised it was even running with this <laughs> same thing super thin electrode 
and very fouled, you know. Looks like she's running rich, so we're gonna adjust that as well. Same thing here. Now, this one has some color on it. <laughs> All right, so what we have here is NGK BPR 6 ES, right? BPR 6 ES. That's what I'm going to use. I'm going to gap them. I'm going to make sure that we have 25. They should be gapped, but we're going to check them just in case. So 25 tau or 0.635 inches, uh, millimeters. Yeah, and the gap is a little bit too big. Okay. There you go. So, let's start her and see if there's any difference. All right, so what happened here was I made the same mistake that I make all the time. I thought I hit the recording button, but apparently I didn't. And then I went through all the waveforms, the burn times and everything. And then when I was done, I thought that I was turning the camera off. And in fact, I turned it on. <laughs> so uh, the waveforms look much better. Unfortunately, I can't show you now, but later in the video, we're going to go back to them. So you're going to see them. But the burn time increased. If we actually go back to the beginning of this clip that I recorded by mistake, you can see here on the screen, the burn times are still there. So they all went to above 2 milliseconds and they were 1.6, 1.7 with the previous spark plugs. So somehow the new spark plugs changed that. Also the RPM dropped by a little, but now the engine is a little bit shaky. So like I said, we're going to come back to the waveforms later. Let's look at the burn times now, what affected them. So this is showing how the burn time gets affected by different conditions. So high secondary resistance leads to shorter burn time, open secondary circuit, shorter burn time, low resistance in so secondary circuit, it's longer burn time. So narrow or no gap or fouled spark plug, which we know that the spark plugs are new and we gap them. So we know that the gap is good and we know that they're still not fouled. Um, sharp electrode, we know that the electrode is not sharp anymore, it used to be, <laughs> or the spark plugs are too hot. Well, our new spark plugs shouldn't be too hot because the old ones were BPR5 and these are BPR6 and according to this NGK spark plugs chart, the higher the number, the colder the spark plug is. So BPR6 should be colder than BPR5. So I guess that's not our problem. But about the fuel mixture, it says that if you have a rich fuel mixture, that leads to longer burn time. And also advanced timing can lead to longer burn times. So before we get to the mixture, let's check the, the timing. All right, so I found the top dead center mark here on the, here on the pulley and I marked it with white so it's seen easily. And I'm not sure this vacuum advance works <laughs> but whatever we need to disconnect it in order to come on okay we need to disconnect it in order to take a proper measurement of the timing and i'm gonna plug the hole of course and now i'm gonna take a timing light and i have marked there only the top dead center mark uh, but this light i can dial it to flash a little bit after it gets the signal from the spark plug wire so, which means if i dial it to 10 degrees for example and my top dead center mark uh, lines up with the pointer this means that the spark goes 10 degrees before top dead center then the light waits for 10 degrees and then it flashes and then i'm at top dead center you know what i mean so let's see what it's gonna show <laughs> So 
So not only this, it's zero actually. I don't know how well you can see. So that shows exactly top that center. So we are way retarded here. Because we need to fire 6 to 10 before top dead center. But if I go 6 to 10 before, so now here we are at 10, you see? And when I point the mark, okay, now we are way past top dead center. So we are way, way retarded. Huh. Let's advance it a little bit. How the, the RPM even went up, went up. So that's more than 10 now. So I'm gonna turn it until it is 10. Right here now it is 10. Alright, now what I want to check is zoom out. I want to check if the mechanical assumption is working, so I'm going to point the light. Yeah. I don't know if you see. I hope that you see the mark. I don't know how to position you. Maybe I should position you higher. Now I'm gonna dive it to 25, let's say, because that's where we have to be 25, 30 degrees before top dead center at, let's say, 27. At higher RPM, like 3000 RPM maybe. And let's see now. So now you can see how we are retarded. The mark, the top dead center mark points after the top dead center. So let's see. Yeah. It does exactly what it's supposed to do. So I'm happy with the mechanical advance. All right, but our burn times are still high. But let's see the waveform, the secondary waveform. The spark line looks pretty good on cylinder four. Let's see one, two, three, and four. So you see one and two have lots of fluctuations here before the end or at the end of the spark line. Three and four don't have that. Well, every once in a while it showed up in three, four. Yeah, let's see what that means. Okay, so I can't find anything that shows fluctuations at the end of the spark line but but fluctuations like we have like it's not a straight line it's a little very little oscillations indicates rich fuel mixture or spark line the spark line is also lower and longer than normal so we know that our spark line is longer it needs to be lower than two and it's above two and it also has those oscillations so Let's check the fuel mixture. So we're gonna go with the old method. Let me start it first. So we're gonna go with the old method. We'll test the airflow first and see between the two carbs. Oh my God, everything is so dirty, I can't stand it. Let's see how balanced the two carbs are. Oh. I need to adjust it. Look at the front one. 
doesn't suck at all. What if I press the throttle? Okay, so that's already a problem. So you see in some of the screens we had a difference between cylinders number one and two and three and four. And that's definitely the reason why. So let's loosen the linkage and try to adjust the airflow. Okay, so now the two are disconnected and I can play with them separately. So now with the idle screw, I can open the throttle a little bit only for this part. So let's see where that brought us. Okay, now they're pretty even, aren't they? Now we can connect them again. We can tighten the screw in the middle again. And let's double check. Yeah, nice and even airflow. So now let's see what's gonna happen if we raise the air pump a little bit. So, just to remind you, if the RPM go high and stay high, it is too rich. If the RPM goes low and even the engine dies, then it's too lean. If the RPM doesn't change or it goes a little bit up and then goes back to normal, then that's where we want to be. So that's definitely too rich. So, on these carbs, they're SU carbs we can adjust the mixture with this nut here underneath which raises or lowers the jet so we have a needle which is tapered inside the jet so the lower the jet the more open it is the more fuel goes in the, the higher the jet the less open it is because the, the needle is tapered so the higher the jet the less fuel can go through so we need to lower it so we're gonna take a no, we're gonna take, uh, I believe that's 5 eighths, and we're gonna turn it one flat down. Did I do anything? Yes. So let's try that again now. Still too rich. Oh, we are opening it. That's why. Oh my god, I'm going the wrong way. all the way up now we're all the way up and it's still rich hmm. let's see this one This one goes up, but then it goes back down. Let's see this one. This one goes up, but it doesn't go down. All right, so I played as much as I could with them, I <laughs> and it turns out now they're both all the way up. The jets are closed as much as they can go. And I think it still runs a little bit rich, but that's what I can do. Actually, uh, I found that here there's a pin that when you push up, it pushes the. You see, I can raise the, I can raise the pump with this pin here. So 
So actually, when I raise it a little bit with the pin, it doesn't raise the RPM too much on this carb. And this one too, it raises a little bit, but it's not crazy. So that's where we're gonna leave it. Let's see how that affected the scope reading. And then I did it again. I did not record the readings on the scanner, but they did not change. The burn times remained around 2 milliseconds, so I just decided to leave it as is and take it for a test drive. So apparently, even though I thought that it was driving well before, now it's driving so much better. Huh? You like it? <laughs> wow! I actually didn't know the abilities of this car. <laughs> it's like a different car now. No, wow. it's the same car, just Well, it's actually a few days later. <laughs> so uh, the little tuning up job turned into a spring maintenance job because I just started and I couldn't stop. So what I've done after I tuned it up as far as I could, I cleaned up a little bit as much as I could without taking anything apart, polished a little bit the air cleaners. It's a shame, they're nice and chrome and they were so bad before uh took out some of the parts that i could well i don't want to lose this okay some of the things that i could for example this cover from here i took and cleaned up the cup here i cleaned up turned out i needed to top up the coolant uh, took out these food bowls from here and the nuts and i cleaned them up and i Evaporated them actually, so hopefully now they're not gonna rust again. I I've been told that the evaporast is not gonna, is not only gonna clean them up from the rust, but it's also gonna keep them, prevent them from rusting again. All the linkage here I just uh, brushed evaporast on, so I don't have the time to deal with everything properly. I wish I had the time to take them out completely and clean them up and maybe zinc plate them or something like everybody keeps telling me here as well i cleaned up a little bit rust wherever i could uh, i had an, a fuel leak here on the fuel line here and the fuel filter needed to be changed anyway so i changed everything from here up to the pump even bought new fitting for here actually this is a brake line <laughs> turns out quarter inch brake line with a fitting fits perfectly here i just cut off the flaring from the brake line at the end and i put one of those uh, the compression fitting sleeves so now it holds perfectly new filter replace the oil since we were in the spring every spring i change my oil doesn't matter how many kilometers i drove so i wrote the date and the kilometers what else did i do here oh i had a problem a few years ago, to be honest, this hose blew as I was on the road. So what I did was I disconnected this one from here, connected it, connected it straight there, and I bypassed my valve. Ever since, I had heat in the summer. <laughs> Believe it or not, I never found time to put it back normally. So now I found the hose, I put it here, put this one here. So now my valve apparently operates. And then I went inside and I did this. <laughs> I took the transmission cover off because my speedometer wasn't working. So I bought a new cable for that and I wanted to install it. But when I took the cover off, it turned out that this whole barrel here, the speedometer gear carrier, I believe it's called, it came out like half an inch for whatever reason. This screw came loose and the barrel came off. So obviously the gear was not meshed anymore with the output shaft so put that back together now it works great here um some of you may remember a few years ago i made my own bushings on the lathe here for the shifter 
and that lasted for a month or two. They lasted for a month or two, and then they got ruined again. So now that I was here, I made new bushings. I don't know why I didn't film all that, but now this is so much better. Like before, everything was so loose here. Uh, I also, since I was here, I also changed the transmission oil. Uh, GL4 by Redline, MT90. Topped up the differential as well. Didn't change it there because I don't have a drain plug, of course. <laughs> so only topped this up and then I went and I lubricated all the wheel hubs everywhere where I could. I also uh, greased all the grease nipples that I could. I just saw one that I didn't grease. I realized that I have to grease my water pump as well. So I'm gonna come and do this one. And that's it. Before I put the transmission cover on though, I wanna go and test it on the road and see if everything goes well because, oh, Another thing that I did was, since I was here, I didn't, I think I had a little leak on the slave cylinder. So since I was here, I changed this entire line for the slave cylinder because the fittings were really bad. Let me show them to you. So these, these were the fittings. I couldn't tighten them. Anyway, so I changed the whole line. So now because I changed that whole entire line, I want to make sure that uh, the clutch operates properly before I put the transmission cover back on. So I'm going to go for a test drive. All right, I let her warm up, but I don't know if you notice. Do you see the flurries? Yeah. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> it was 27 degrees Celsius the other day like literally four or five days ago, 27 degrees Celsius. And now it is two degrees and snowing. Like this is crazy. Anyways, I know it's not gonna stay. Next week it's gonna be warm again, but anyways, we need to go for a test drive. So we are going for a test drive with the top down while it's snowing. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, I got a little bit carried away. <laughs> My dust light for the signals was not working ever since I restored the car. I never made it work. And now I decided to see what was wrong with it. And while I was there, I changed the bulbs to LEDs. And now you see how bright they are. To be honest on camera, they look much brighter. It's not such, it's not so bright. But it all started with this light. The brake light was not working, so I had to change the bulb and I started dealing with lights, made sure that everything works and I got carried away. Now look at that. Ooh, wait a minute. Everything comes on as soon as I turn the ignition on. Wow, look at that. Okay, that's really bright. I should have put LED there, you know? <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, I don't know if I told you, but I went on the test drive, everything went well, it was perfect, it was snowing, <laughs> fantastic. So I put her together, put the radio back, and it works as it should. Let me turn off the lights now. The light is done, what else? I had something else that I wanted to do. Oh yeah, the choke cable. The choke cable doesn't come back, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with it, but when I push from inside, when I push it in, it doesn't come back. I have to come and manually do it from here. So I think that's the last thing that I have to do. Everything else, I think it looks good. I was thinking maybe I should change this brake line as well, because now look at this one, how nice and clean it is. And it's gonna stay that way because it's a nickel copper line or copper nickel. I always forget which one goes first. Anyway, so I wanted to change this one as well, but this means I have to bleed brakes and stuff, so, you know, 
it's working for now i'm just gonna leave it so yeah that's it oh i forgot to tell you i fixed the exhaust as well because it was hanging way too low that was when i was uh that was when i had my leg broken so in the summer of 2021 so almost two years ago i had my leg broken i was i was driving it with my broken leg and my exhaust fell like the hanger in the back the the last hanger right here fell off and because my leg was broken I hopped on one leg and somehow I put it together and it stayed that way but it needed uh, another hanger in the middle but the other day I went underneath and I fixed her so now even the exhaust is good the clutch is good the shifter is so much better now it is not like going left and right like crazy lights are better she's running better and the engine bay is relatively clean now at least i don't see rust that's what was bothering me the most like it's not nice and shiny anymore as it was seven years ago but at least i don't see rust now which is i love it yeah she was neglected she was neglected so she deserved it she hasn't seen so much attention since she was actually restored so seven years now everything that i neglected for so many years is now taken care of i believe there were so many things <laughs> anyways so thanks for watching guys thanks for commenting and subscribing and sharing and supporting the channel it's really appreciated you know if you go at the bottom of the video there's uh, links that uh, show you different ways of supporting the channel recently i added also the store which is also a way to support me you can go and buy merchandise and i get a little bit of revenue from that as well so so that's from me. I took enough from your time. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.